Hello everyone. One of the questions that young people tend to ask pertains to the story in the Old Testament of Jonah. The story goes that Jonah was asked by God to go and preach to the people of Nineveh so that they would repent of their evil, wicked ways and turn to God and lead a life of righteousness. But uh, Jonah feared the consequences of undertaking such a mission. Therefore, rather than go to Nineveh, he boarded the ship that was going to Tarshish, which obviously was in a different direction. And the story in the Bible goes that uh, the sea experienced great turbulence and the boat by which Noah, uh, Jonah uh, was traveling was about to capsize and uh, Jonah realized that uh, he was the cause of this turbulence, so he told the captain of the ship to cast him into the sea, uh, and uh, he does so. The sea is calmed. Uh, Jonah is followed by a whale, and after three days, uh, the, the, the uh, whale uh, disgorges uh, or vomits uh, Jonah on the shore of Nineveh. Then he uh, undertakes the mission that was intended for him by God. The people of Nineveh repent, they are saved, so the consequences are very commendable, quite contrary to what uh, Jonah apprehended at the beginning. So this is a rough sketch of the story. The question pointedly refers to uh, the dramatic um, depiction uh, of something that um, we find really hard to believe. Um, first of all, it's difficult for young people to believe that if they choose their own way, it could create such a huge elemental turbulence, a uh, whole she, a uh, whole sea, uh, rebelling against one's personal decision. Uh, after all, shouldn't a person have a right to decide what he or she should be doing with his or her own life? This kind of questions. So after all, young people are living uh, in a world of individualism, uh, and individualism implies that individuals are autonomous, which also means that they are outside the control of God, not merely parental authority or the authority of other institutions in the world. They are also autonomous in relation to providence and in relation to God's control. So each person is a captain of the ship of his own life. And that's a kind of uh, larger cultural vision or the worldview in which young people are growing up. And therefore, for them, uh, the, the, uh, stories like this pose particular problems that unfortunately the church is not mindful of it and therefore makes no attempt to put these things in perspective for them which at least could enable them to think <clears throat> and come to their own conclusions. So I'm uh, dealing with this question with that background in mind. First of all, uh, what is the reason for the and uh, skepticism that wakes up in the minds of young people when they are presented stories like this. Uh, the root of the problem lies uh, precisely in this, that the worldview in which they are growing up is one of uh, atomization or fragmentation or discontinuities. Stories like the story of Jonah belong to a worldview which is organic, which is unified or integrated, in which there is no discontinuity between God and humankind, or there is a sense of immediacy and continuity between God and human beings. And therefore, human beings are responsive to the will of God, and they are mindful of their duty to to do the will of God. I mean, as in the uh, model prayer that Jesus taught, we are taught to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, people don't realize that it's very insincere to parrot that prayer without also recognizing the need to believe that uh, there is a sense of oneness about heaven and earth. Why should God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven if the world and heaven are complete contraries and there is no continuity between the two. So the very profound implication in that prayer is that those who 
a youth that prayer must recognize that there is continuity between heaven and earth. I'll give you another evidence for this. When Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the waters of the Jordan, uh, he emerged from the waters and then he had a vision, the vision of heaven opening and the Spirit of God descending upon him in the form of a dove. So what happened through the uh, baptism of Jesus Christ is the abrogation of the alienation between heaven and earth, or rather the restoration of the unity or continuity between heaven and earth. Or put differently, the baptism of Jesus Christ is a bridge between heaven and earth. That's the significance of baptism, which we have completely rejected. And churches have reduced this, or turned this into a mockery of meaning only an initiation ritual into church membership. That's not the idea of Jesus' baptism at all. We're utterly dishonest, insincere, and rebellious to God by twisting and distorting the meaning of baptism in this manner. However, that's not my main theme. That's subject for another day. So our main theme here is that the biblical worldview is an organic worldview in which there is a sense of affinity, oneness, continuity, solidarity, integration, take any word you like, of uh, <coughs> God and human beings. They're not separate entities. Uh, human beings constitute one integrated body and not, uh, you know, an assemblage of mutually alienated fragments <coughs> that, that are meant to war and conquer each other. <coughs> Pardon me. So, from this worldview, from this worldview of God and human beings being very close to each other, and God's will having a material, practical, empirical impact on individual life and destiny, the idea becomes very intelligible and in fact inspiring that God has a very special for each one of us. Believe you me, I have no hesitation in saying that this is a point of great blessedness in my life. It's been so for a long time that I sincerely believed that there is a special purpose with, with which God has created me. And my happiness and my blessedness, my fulfillment lies in fulfilling that particular purpose which underlies my creation. And I'm very deeply grateful to my mother for instilling this belief in me. And I believe she did a tremendous service uh, by me in enabling me to see this very shaping, profound, fundamental truth. So, the very sense of worth that we have actually depends on this. There is a divine purpose underlying our individual life. And each one of us is duty bound or each one of us is answerable to God for how we fulfill or to the extent we neglect the divine purpose underlying our creation. <clears throat> and the story of Jonah is a very dramatic illustration of the same thing. Jonah's purpose, the very purpose of Jonah's existence, the purpose of Jonah's calling, spiritual calling, was to undertake this mission. And it is possible, of course, to go in the opposite direction. And the meaning of this episode, the meaning of the story, highly dramatized story is, that to the extent that you run counter to God's plans and purposes concerning you, your life will be like the turbulent sea. And not only the consequences of that uh, rebellion against the will of God will affect not only you, but everyone around you. In fact, that ship is, is a picturization of social life. All of us are traveling. All of us <coughs> are fellow travelers in the same boat. We sink or swim together. This idea of autonomous individuals who pursue their own destiny without any reference to anything that has gone on before them or that will happen after them, or any reference to what is happening all around them, is complete nonsense. It cannot be sustained by any sensible person. 
is a delusion created by modern culture, the culture of materialism, which is a culture of discontinuities. For example, we talk about the generation gap. It is a creation of the materialistic consumerist culture. It is not the truth of life. It is the deformation of life. And we think, therefore, that we have made a significant discovery about the generation gap and, you know, the impossibility of parents and children being one. Children must rebel. We talk about the terrible teens, so on and so forth, not realizing these are actually symptoms of sickness. It doesn't have to be like this. If individual lives have been formed individual lives are informed by, by the will of God concerning each individual, each individual. I can assure you, there will be perfect harmony at home, there will be no terrible, tween, uh, uh, terrible teens. Parents and children will become partners together in the marvelous purposes of God. There will be peace and joy and fulfillment in that home. The problem is that we don't accept it anymore, even though we are Christians. In theory, of course, we, went, we endorse all of this, but our life is lived entirely according to worldly principles. And today, therefore, the worldly culture shapes us that according to that culture, whatever people are saying is right. There is no connection between you and me. There is no idea of neighbor. Leave alone there being any sense of accountability to God. I am an isolated atom. That's what's called why we are called... Uh, our society is called an atomized society. Now, it's not a, t a title of honor, it's a description of a disease. Atomized society. And within this atomized society, what's applied to the individuals? Each individual is supremely alone. Alone. And each individual is consigned to his or her private hell. And this is one of the reasons why suicides are going through the roof. Because people suddenly find that there is no meaning to their life and therefore their life becomes a burden to them. That burden is unbearable. And they come to the conclusion that the sooner they get rid of this meaningless burden, the better it is for them. So therefore, my friends, that the worldview within which or the understanding of the realities of life or the understanding of the total picture of life within which human imagination can create stories like the story of uh, Jonah, in which is actually driven by an eternal reality. This is not story, this is not fiction, this is the truth of life. There is no reality beyond this. The reality that each one of us is God's creation and therefore our life is imbued with a divine purpose. And to the extent that we stay faithful to the divine purpose, our own life is fulfilled and the consequences of that fulfillment, which the Bible refers to as fruitfulness. And if you read the 15th chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus uses the metaphor of fruitfulness there. If, I, if you abide in me and I in you, your life will be fruitful. So that fruitfulness then becomes a metaphor of the blessedness we impart to the life of others. That's how a healthy, happy society is created. At the center of which, or presiding over which, there is the supervening will of God. That's why we say that God is sovereign. What does sovereignty mean? Sovereignty means to accept the sovereignty of God over us, without which there is no Christianity, there is no spirituality. To accept the sovereignty of God over us is to accept the fact that we have to surrender our will to the will of God, and then our life becomes the medium through which divine purposes are worked out and fulfilled. And our life then experiences that rare joy and delight of thankfulness, truth and thankfulness, thankfulness, which is not a matter of our lips alone, but of our total being. That's the blessedness of life, the spiritual understanding of the human predicament or human life uh, envisages. Now, we have left all this behind and therefore, we find it so very difficult to believe or understand, for that matter, the fundamental spiritual truths embedded in the story of Jonah. It's a very profound story if you really read it in the right manner, not in the manner that's often preached in churches. After, unfortunately, church preaching uh, distracts from the real greatness of the Bible. It's not the Bible that is preached, unfortunately. Therefore, I commend to people, all those who are listening to me, they, uh, they, that they read the Bible on their own. 
forgetting all that they have been filled with or dumbed upon. Now, these sort of uh, parochial, preachy, sermonic misinterpretations of the Bible. Unfortunately, we are fed from birth onwards with this uh, uh, bulk without nutrition. I'm using an expression from a book written by an American author called Eric Fromm. Um, and the book is titled Anatomy of Human Destructiveness. We're describing the effect of the media on the people. He says, modern media is bulk without nourishment. It's a very appropriate description. So I thought I'd share that with you. You can remember this. Uh, make it a habit to remember some of these wonderful expressions. Modern media is bulk without nourishment. It's so very true. So much of the preachings belongs, uh, uh, belongs to this category of bulk without nourishment. And those who peddle these uh, inane, inanities, um, uh, pointless things, they are in no position to help the young people with their questions. Therefore, they create the impression that it's impious to ask questions. Whereas I tell you, it's a sacred spiritual duty to ask fundamental questions. And that's the freedom God has given to you. That's also the responsibility that God has imposed on you. And uh, if you ask questions, you will get answers. That's God's faithfulness. Please read Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask and it will be given you. Now, in Malayalam translation, it is beg. Uh, and I prefer the English word ask also means asking questions, not maybe asking for favors. Asking for answers is also asking, isn't it? You have to ask, 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 never stop asking. I find, I've always found, asking to be a very blessed experience. So thank you for this question, and I will continue with this endeavor of raising and answering questions. I chose to answer this question in English rather than Malayalam. All the previous questions were dealt with in Malayalam, but this, uh, I made an exception in this case because the question that typically young people ask, and it so happens that today, because of the great changes happening in us, Malayali youth, young people, especially growing up in various cities of India and overseas, they are not comfortable in Malayalam. I can't blame them one bit. These are the exigencies of one's condition of life. Therefore, for their sake, realizing that they may not be uh, adequately grounded in Malayalam, I thought I would use my broken English and share these insights with you in that medium. So may God bless you uh, through these biblical reflections. And please share your thoughts, uh, your questions with me so that together we can seek for answers. By the way, this question was suggested to me by a friend in the media world. I will not mention his name because these days people feel very disturbed when they are known to be associated with me because church authorities are very well, uh, such authorities will get very upset with them. So out of consideration and courtesy towards them, I will not mention his name, but I want to place on record my gratitude, my appreciation for his suggesting that I deal with this question and have done that. And if there are further questions arising out of the material I have shared or thoughts I have shared, please let me know so that we can continue these reflections and to arrive at a deeper and wider understanding of this, of the, one of the most fundamental aspects of the biblical faith. Thank you very much.